tonight is this love of Christ that you've invited us to be involved in. And so we celebrate you today. We love you. We honor you. And we just want to bring you glory today from the depths of our heart. So, Father, we, we thank you. We say we know it's, it's crazy and it's silly on our side. And we probably don't have the dates right. But what a great day to say happy birthday, Jesus. We are going tomorrow morning to just, as individuals, just celebrate your birth. And we thank you for loving us. So we bless you today. Holy Spirit, be glorified in this place. We need the fullness of you in this place. We ask you to come and, and invade every heart in this room. And we ask that you would be glorified today. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. Merry Christmas. And let's celebrate together. Good morning, River family. How is everyone? Guess what? I emphasize the word family because today we're family and this is our living room and we're going to relax we're going to get in the spirit of Christmas we're going to focus on the birth of a baby who was more powerful than we would ever believe than we can ever believe he's come here he came on this earth for a purpose and that was to save us and to love us and to give us eternal life and you never think about that when you look at a newborn baby. You just look at how cute they are. And, but we know that our kids, we always pray for our kids. We want them successful. We want things, good things for our kids. And that's what this baby Jesus, when he came to earth, his purpose was just to love us all. And he suffered and died so that we could have eternal life. If you don't know Jesus today, we want you to know him before you leave this place. Okay? He loves you. He loves you no matter what state you're in, no matter how frazzled you are, no matter what you're going through. He is always going to be with you. He is always going to love you. He's going to accept you just as you are. And we want you to know that if you don't know that. And uh, we will pray with you after this service. We'll pray with you anytime if you need it. You just come on. But right now, we're in our living room our family of River Church. And we're going to sit here, we're going to sing some songs and it's just like we're in our living room just worshiping our newborn King. So sing with us. Worship with us. Listen to the words. You know all of these songs. So we want you just to take them to heart. Listen to those verses. Let them minister to you. And you just enjoy this time with your family and you enjoy the time with your church family, okay? Let's all be one this morning and worship and adore our Lord. Come and worship, come.
see the other thing that we know here is not only does Jesus like rock and roll, but he likes it all. And we just want to come and celebrate him. And so what we're going to do now is we want this to be such an incredible uh, time of blessing. I'm just going to ask you guys if you would stand with me. And I'm going to pray over us and then give us a time to go into communion. I want to just explain, because I know that we may have some visitors here today. I want to explain to you the way we look at communion. If you're here and you've, you're just visiting with us, or, or maybe you just don't understand the concept of communion, the reason that we do this, we come to this table, and we take this, we take this piece of bread, and we take this cup, and the Bible says that as long as we do this, that we are proclaiming the death of our Savior. And He wants us to do this for as long as we live. He wants us to recognize and to remember that He died on the cross, totally paying for all of our sins, that He washed away all of our sins. Let me tell you something, church. As you come to this table today, I want to remind you of this. Not only did He pay for our sins, but the Scripture says that by His stripes... We were healed. He also took all of our sicknesses, our infirmities, all of our weaknesses, all of our struggles. He took that on himself on the cross. And so when you come to this table this morning, the only thing that we, the only thing that we know the scripture teaches that you ought to do before you come to this table, the scripture says you ought to examine yourself. That you take this time, whenever I pray, that you take this time and you say, Lord, search my heart. Father, if there's some unthing, if there's any unclean ways in me, show me those things. I want to turn from those things because, Lord, I want to follow you. The scripture says that when we do that, when we examine ourselves, that we can come to this table and partake and expect to see the fullness of God in our lives. But it also says... And please hear me say this. The scripture also says that when we don't examine ourselves first and we come and take of this table, it says for this very reason, some of you have become weak and even fallen asleep. What it's talking about is dying. This table, this communion table, it's an important thing, church. I mean, your life he wants you to understand that your life has great value. And He wants you to examine your heart as you do this. And my prayer is though, as you come to this table, as, as a family, or if you're not here with someone, come find me. I'd love to take communion with you. You come to this table and you pick this cup up and you take this bread. And you say, Lord, thank you that your body was broken for me. And that your blood purchased my healing that you became my provision, that you are my source of life, that you have done these things past tense, and I have the ability to move in them now. That's the way I want you to approach this table today, recognizing that he is the source of life for all of us. So let's pray together. Jesus, as we come before you today, we are so humbled. We are so we so recognize the fullness of the, your presence, God, in this room. And we humbly, Father, we, we don't have to be afraid of you, but the scripture says for us to come before you with fear and trembling. Not that you're mad, not that you're going to hurt us, but in recognition of the great power that you are. You are the source of life. And we come before you trembling this morning, recognizing your goodness. And I thank you for the sanctity of what we're about to be able to do. To take of this communion table, to take this bread in and to take this cup. Recognizing that you paid for all of our sins. That you paid for all of our sicknesses. That you paid for all of our diseases. And that you, you are the source of provision and life for us. That this table holds the answer to every question we'll ever ask. And so we ask you for the fullness to let us experience you in that mindset. Help us to recognize ourselves and to say, Father, search my heart. Help us all to pray. Search my heart, God. If there's any unclean way in me, show me so that I can repent of that. I want to confess it and turn from it so that I can walk in your ways. We 
love you and we bless you and we thank you for being Emmanuel God with us not God distant but God here with us we love you and we bless you in Jesus name we pray amen so church you just grab whoever you're with you come take this time of communion and you enjoy this time with God
you guys. I mean, come on. Who wouldn't want to get up and preach after that? So good. And so I am so excited this morning to be able to share with you guys these, this idea of hope that we've been talking about. We've been talking about the concept of hope and, and learning what it means to see hope. And today, I, I, I want you to be able to, to see it. I want you to understand that hope is not some strange thing that we just think about every once in a while, but that hope is something that we can actually see. Because, let me just, let me just give you one uh, spiritual truth that will help you through so many things in life. If you can see something, if you can see something, then you can grab onto it. And the scripture tells us that we can't just live by what we see. Because if we just live by what we see with our physical eyes, then our faith doesn't have any action involved. And so the Lord wants us to be able to see things before our physical eyes will get to it. And with that understanding, I want to tell you that today, I believe you're going to be able to see what hope looks like. So, to see hope. The only way that I know how, or the best way, especially where we are today, that I can describe to you seeing hope, you have to start with me on Christmas morning. And I know most of you in this room... You, you are like me. You are grubby. You are ready for Christmas morning. And not one of you is going to unwrap that first gift Christmas morning, unwrap that second gift, and then go, that's pretty cool. I think I'm done. I know you. You will be shredding through them. You will shred through them and... And it's so, it's so, uh, I got to scoot these chairs out because if I start feeling like I'm in a cage, it's going to be scary. You're going to shred through those gifts, and as you go through them, 
you're going to be going through them so much that you're not even going to be able to savor what you've opened because you're, you know you'll have plenty of time for that. You just want to see what's next. You're ready to get to the next place and get to the next point. And I, I want to tell you that this is not going to be a typical Christmas message because I want to tell you that I believe most of us live lives that look just like that. The Lord has given us these things, and we've opened up one or two of them, and we've said, this is, this is it. This is, this, is what I'm, this is what I was hoping for. This is what I'm holding on to. And so we don't even open up the rest of the things that he's provided for us. And I want to show you that in the scriptures because I believe that you'll be able to see a picture of hope. This is one of my favorite days of the whole year because getting the opportunity to read this passage of Scripture that probably has, I mean, that does have more meaning. It's, it's been read more than any other passage of Scripture. And having the privilege of being able to read this to you, it's always one of the highlights of my year. Luke chapter 2. The Scripture says this. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken in the entire Roman world. This was the very first census that took place while Quinarius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him but was, and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in clothes, and she placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. This is where it all began. And if you could hear me say anything to you today, I would have you hear me say, that's talking about you. Peace on whom his favor rests. And I wonder if you have unwrapped the idea that you have, that it's not something that you have to that you have to go to the store and get, but that you have the favor of God. I was talking to some people the other day, and they said, they, we were talking about just some difficulties in life, and I said, you know, I, I just, to be honest with you, I don't look at life that way. And this woman said, well, how do you, how do you look at it? I mean, she, she was having some trouble, and I wasn't recognizing the trouble in the same way that she did. And she said, well, then how do you look at it? And I said, well, I don't mean to, I'm not trying to be contentious with you, but I try to look at everything in my life through the favor of God. Because that's what he's given me. And whenever I have the favor of God and the forefront of what I look at, guess what that does? That makes me not look at things the same way. I don't look forward to sicknesses. I don't look forward to diseases. I don't look forward to problems. I don't, I don't try to close my eyes and act like they don't exist. But here's what I do believe. I believe that I serve this Jesus that came and was born on this earth that took care of all of those things for me. 
And so I don't have to look with a nervousness about what's going to happen next because I know what happens next, church. He's already provided for it. And whenever you understand that, that this favor of God was given to us to walk in, I want you to hear me say it will change the way you live life the rest of today. I know so many of you. I'm not throwing stones at you. But I'm telling you, a life that, that, that is lived without looking through the focal point at the favor of God is obvious. It's as obvious as being involved in a life that does look at the favor of God. It changes the way that you live. Church, I'm telling you, I, I know right now, you're, you're not sure where we're going, but we're going somewhere. Listen to me. If you don't begin to involve the favor of God in your life, you are going to leave something unwrapped that God meant for you to open up. We live life like the whole point is to accept Christ and to get saved and, and, and we leave everything else wrapped up under the tree. And I know you as individuals, not one of you tomorrow night will have any presents left under the tree unless you're just waiting for somebody to show up and you're going to do Christmas later. But at the end of your Christmas, the tree, the presents and the gifts under the tree... They won't be there anymore. They'll be unwrapped and you'll be partaking of them. Because as you give gifts to each other, the point is not to just have a gift that you leave sitting wrapped up under the tree. But the point is open this up. Use it. Wear it. Smell it. Whatever it is. Partake of it. So this Christmas story that we read here in Luke chapter 2 shows us the birth of Jesus but then it takes us to what and I'm glad you asked that question it takes us to Ephesians look at Ephesians chapter 2 Ephesians chapter 2 and I want to start reading in verse 3 all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ. So let me just stop you for a second. Leave that there because we're going to go right back. But, but I got to make a point here. Listen, this is not what's going to happen someday. You are not someday going to be seated with Christ. Are you going to be seated in heaven with Christ? Are you going to physically be there and dwell with him forever? Yes, but listen to me. This is something I need you to understand. This is that seeing hope. You are already there. I know we don't see it, and I know that's a hard concept for us, but I'm telling you what this passage is saying to us is that we have already been seated with Christ. So why would we allow the troubles and the struggles and the things that shut us down in life to shut us down? The only way we're able to be shut down on the level that we are is to not understand who we are and where we are. We're seated with Christ already. What do I have available to me? Listen, you're not, you're not getting this because, I mean, I don't know. That, I'm, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to use wisdom. <laughs> but wake up in your spirit. Wake up, man of God. Wake up, woman of God. You are seated with Christ. Why in the world would we allow the world to destroy us on the level that it does? Why would we let, us, well, let ourselves just have our butts kicked like we do? And I know you're not supposed to say get your butts kicked on Christmas. But come on, man. You're seated with Christ. You're seated with him. And for you to... 
for you to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and then never participate with him in this life, but to accept him and then to just push the hold button and wait until you die someday and be with him someday is a wrong way to do things. It's wrong. He didn't die just to be your Savior. He died to provide you with life. And you've, he seated you with him. He seated you in heaven with him. Let me show you what it goes on to say. He has seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ in order that in the coming ages he might show, uh, please listen, he might show the, incom the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Some of you may think I'm crazy, but I'm telling you right now. To continue to live the existences that we continue to live is absolutely wrong. He doesn't want to just be your savior, but he wants to change your life. He wants to be the Lord of your every single day. Why? Because if you don't engage, if you never get this, and you never become what he's destined you to become, then the world around you never is able to see the fullness of what he really looks like. How is the world around you supposed to see what Jesus looks like, the way he is, his mannerisms and his actions, if you're not walking in the fullness of this destiny that he's provided for you? Church, listen to me. It's, it matters today, but it's going to matter. It's going to matter when we stand in front of him. And we're either, going to, we're either going to celebrate the fact that we set course, we set out to live this life, to show the world what Jesus looks like, or we're going to answer for why we didn't. Why? Why would you not be interested in being what I called you to be here on earth? Listen to this last verse again, verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ, and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and it is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Look at verse 10, church. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to go to heaven. Is that what that says? Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You were not created. You were not created to just accept him and go to heaven someday. Push pause and wait until you go to heaven someday. You were created. You, you guys, you're not, you, you don't want to hear this because it requires some action out of you. We don't want to talk about these things because it requires some involvement in us. What it really requires is that we, we allow him to create some change in the core of who we are. We don't continue to do what we've always done because we get caught up in the fact that, oh, Oh my gosh, this God, this Jesus Christ that we celebrate that was born on this day 2,000 years ago, he was there before that. His birth, that's not when he began, church. The scriptures tell us that in the very beginning, in the very beginning of Genesis, Jesus was right there with God, that by him, everything that's been made was only made through him. So what Jesus did was he left heaven and he was willing to come and be born on earth as a man just like you and I. So that he could understand life like we do. So that he could walk through life just like us. And face every temptation. And face every struggle that you and I face. And overcome it. So that he could be nailed to the cross. To take every awful thing you and I have ever done inside his body. 
pay for our sins so that we might be saved? I just want to tell you that that's an incredibly selfish way to look at this incredible life of the God of the universe. To think that he came and died on the cross for you to just be saved and to never create any change in your life. To never call you to something bigger than you is an absolute wrong way to read the scriptures. You were created. You were created, verse 10 says, we we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us all to do he prepared these things for us while we were sinners Christ died for us because he loves us it's by grace through faith and not of yourselves what does that mean it does it means we don't have to have enough faith to to be able to participate in these things everything that he's called you to in life works just like your salvation When you you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you did that by grace through faith. You had enough faith to recognize that I'm in trouble without you and I need you. And that faith, that little bitty tiny bit of faith on your part activated this salvation, this, this incredible thing that he did for us to come and be alive in you. But church, listen to me. That's the same way you experience everything that he has for you by faith. I don't understand how to get over this. I don't know how to deal with this sickness, but by faith, I believe you do. I don't know how I'm ever going to get over this place of lack in my life, but by faith, I believe you do. I don't know how I'm ever going to get over this struggle in my marriage, this struggle with my kids, and I don't know what this looks like, and I don't feel like I got enough faith in me but by faith I believe you do his faith he provides it for us so why listen to me the whole point is this so why is it a big deal why is it a big deal for my life to never change for me to never become what he's called me to do because it's saying to him that his faith just wasn't quite enough it just wasn't enough You reached me to get me to salvation, but you just couldn't quite reach me to change my life. By grace, through faith, not of yourselves. Because if it was of your own faith, what you would do, this passage says, is that you would boast about it. So he supplies it all, church. It's his grace. It's his faith. It's his salvation. It's his son, Jesus Christ. And we get it all. When we get him, we get it all. I want to tell you, I want to make a statement that affects 100% of the people in this room. You have it all. The scripture says that he has given you everything that you need for life and for godliness. You have it all. You have it all. But I wonder what you've unwrapped. Because most of us in this room today have become content at the idea that, well, I've unwrapped salvation, that'll do. But you see, that passage of Scripture doesn't say that you were created in Christ to become saved. That Scripture says that you were created in Christ for good works. Because he wants more. He's given you more. And he wants you to open up more. So what I'm saying to you is today, have you begun to understand that? That you have it all. That you were created not to just go to heaven, but that you were created for good works. You have it all. And God wants us to unwrap everything. Salvation is absolutely from him. But he wants more for us and through us. Look at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, listen to verse 6. Verse 6 says, Consider Abraham. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to them. All nations will be blessed through you. So listen to me. 
If you've been here the last few weeks, this is going to start to tie in a little bit. If you haven't, you ought to go back and listen to the last few weeks. Because I've had some really weird things said to me. Over the last few weeks, we talked about the testimony of Abraham. And God blessed Abraham because of where he was. Was it because of what he did? No, it wasn't because of what he did. Abraham did terrible things. Abraham did awful things. And yet God still blessed him. Because it was about where he was. And then we brought Mike up and Mike gave his testimony. And we were, we were I had people come to me and say, why would you do that? Listen to me. Because you belong here. The whole point is, Abraham, Mike, me, you. It's all about us. It's all about our testimony. It's all about God using you. You coming to the place that you recognize that he wants more than to just be your savior. But that he really does care about all of your life. And he really does want to be involved in all of you. And what has he provided for you? That's this verse. This verse, it talks about Abraham. And because the author is wanting to remind us, remember Abraham. Remember Abraham. And remember the promise that was given to him. Why does it do that? Watch this. That those who believe are children of Abraham. We have to remember that. We have to know that. That all nations will be blessed through you. Look at verse 9. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. People are going to say to me, why, why did you preach these other things? Why didn't you just talk about Jesus being born? Why didn't you? Because I don't want to give you half of the story. I want to give you the whole thing. I want you to understand. I, I, I wish I could grab each of you for a minute and, and like slap you or pinch you or something. Like Larry Moe and Curly poke you in the eyes. To say, listen to me. Listen to me. Man, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to me. It matters. What we do matters. Man, it matters. And, I, and this is going to be a, a heavy statement. I know that. But, but I'm going to finish this message by showing you that if the 300 of us would be committed to letting him do what he wants to do through us, if we would come together and we would commit together as a family, I want you to understand this passage that I just read that you buzzed by. Though It says, all all nations will be blessed through you. Those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. That if the 300 of us would see today and we would, we would say, I want to unwrap more than just salvation. I want to unwrap the whole thing. I want to be involved with him. If we would do that, this whole community and every community that you live around would look different this time next year if we would make that commitment. But if we just keep playing church, it'll look about the same this time next year. And I, and I love you. But I don't want to look the same. Because I believe the calling of God in my life and in your life is to be a blessing to everything around us. Look what it goes on to say. I want you to see. Skip down to verse 16. I, I want to teach you some deep things really quick, but it's all going to have some meaning. We'll wrap it up at the end. Listen to this. Verse 16. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed. Listen, church meaning one person who is Christ. Now go down to verse 26. You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek nor free nor slave nor male nor female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, listen church, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now stay with me. Let's go skip over to verse 4. I want you to look at verse 6. Because you are sons, God sent 
the spirit of his son, this is the Holy Spirit, into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. The reason that I have to preach this whole message of the Christmas story is because what that verse says, you see when that verse says that the Holy Spirit comes and cries out, Abba, Father, you got to understand, you got to understand the heart of a father and the heart of a child. Doesn't matter. My, my boy here, 22 years old. At what age do you think I'm going to stop listening if he were to call out for help? Stay with me. If he calls out to me for help, I'm going to hear his voice above every other voice that there is in the world. That'll never stop. It's never going to stop. Because he's mine. This passage of scripture says that the Holy Spirit has been given to you. And that the Holy Spirit cries out from the inside of us, Abba, Father. He's crying out from the inside of me and from the inside of you to allow us to walk in the fullness of what God has for us. Because we are not the seeds, but we are the seed of Abraham. So what is that? And this is what I'm going to end with. This passage from Genesis chapter 22. Look at this. Genesis chapter 22 verse 17. This is God talking. I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. Now, some of y'all that have a whole lot of babies, that doesn't mean you have to yourself have that many kids. The Bertrands in here? Oh, we are. Here we are. See, my brother, my brother Brett thought that meant he was supposed to populate the earth. It's all of us. Watch this, though. Seriously. I'm, I'm, I'm being so serious. Please catch this. I want you to see this verse. I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. Watch this, church. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. You see, we read passages like that and we go, oh, well, yeah, but that's Old Testament stuff. I don't have to understand that. I just read that to you from Genesis, but that's the promise that we were just talking about from the New Testament. Me and you, listen to me, church, because I, I still don't think you're getting it. Me and you are heirs to that promise. What does that mean? That means that our kids are supposed to possess the land of their enemies. So what is it? Well, I struggle. I can't, I can't, I can't get, I can't grow. I can't get out of this place. Are you kidding me? Yes, you can. The promise of Abraham says you can. The promise of Abraham says that your children are supposed to possess the cities of their enemies. What does that mean for us, Mark? That means this. This is what I tell you all the time. That means that we here at the river, we just can't be content to come together and meet together once in a while. But that means here at the river, we have an obligation set before us to take care of a world full of kids around us that nobody's taking care of today. That means that we here at the river are supposed to take care of older people whenever they get to the point that they can't do that. But listen, that's going to take more involvement than what we've been willing to do. There's a calling of God in our lives. The blessing of Abraham is on every single one of us. We're blessed in everything that we do. We either will unwrap that this Christmas season or we'll leave it wrapped up. And I'm telling you that I believe with every ounce of my being that every single year that the Lord God says, let this be the year. Yes, yes, I want this to be the year of salvation for every person in this room. 
God wants you to know him. But don't you know, this is the year that God says, please, won't this be the year that you step into that place of destiny? That you begin to possess the land of your enemies? Because I've blessed everything that you're willing to have faith enough to see. Every work of your hands, if you'll engage faith, you'll see the favor of God show up in that place. And I'm telling you that if we would unwrap that on this Christmas season, that the world that we live in would absolutely look different. And church, that's why I believe that Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for us so that we could know him as our Savior, but so that we could be a blessing. Living each day knowing that you are an heir of God, that you are an heir to the promise of Abraham. This is what it looks like. If you'll unwrap it, I'm done with this. Listen to me. This is what it looks like, that your descendants will possess the land of their enemies and that your offspring, because of you and your offspring, all of the nations on earth will be blessed. How in the world? Can we have a smaller vision of what God's called us to? How? How can we? How can we? How can it not matter? There's a calling in our lives to have this season where we recognize Him, but then when we recognize Him as, yes, the Savior of my life, but as the Lord of my life. So I'm asking you, will 2018 be the year that you unwrap him in your life will 2018 be the year that we allow God to use us to call us to walk in the fullness of what he's destined us for I want this to be the year I want this to be the year that we say Lord could there, could you, could you have a plan for my life? Because I believe that the calling of God in our life is to not look like we look anymore. But to be, he's blessed you. He has blessed you not to just bless you. He's blessed you to be a blessing to the world around you. And the world around you doesn't know what he looks like. And the world around you will never know what he looks like if you don't step into that place of blessing. Seeing life through the favor of God is not just some good idea that maybe we should think about, but I believe it's the calling of God on every single one of our lives. We're blessed. We're so blessed. If you, it's my prayer that you go home tonight that you look at your home, you look at your life, you look at the Christmas trees, you look at the gifts, that you stop for a few minutes as a family and you go, God, God, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. And you allow yourself to see how blessed you are, the favor of God in your life, because when you allow yourself to start to see that, then it'll go beyond you and you'll start to see that he wants to bless you, yes, so that you can in turn turn around and bless the world around you. That's the only way the world's ever going to know what Jesus looks like if we show him. That's it. So, Father, I want to pray today. I celebrate Christmas. I love it. I love gifts and I love uh, presents and I love... Christmas trees and all these awesome things. I love it. There, this, the Christmas season is amazing. But Lord, I'm asking you that you would let this Christmas be the most different Christmas that we've ever had in our lives. I'm asking that you would give us the spirit of revelation, the wisdom in this church to say, this is the year that we unwrap our destiny that we walk in the fullness of who you've called us to be, that we recognize the blessing of God in our lives so that we can turn around and hand it to the world around us.
You're not calling us to take possession of our enemy's land by using a sword and a gun and anger. You're calling us to take possession of the enemy's land by being a blessing to the world around us. We're so blessed. We're way more blessed than what we recognize. But you want our involvement. Let this be the year that we unwrap that. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for dying. Thank you for living. Thank you for being born. Thank you for Christmas. We bless you in this place. Bless every person in this room. I pray that they would see themselves as a person of destiny. I pray that you would change the way that they look at life. That they would look at their life, their marriage, their kids, their jobs, their church. Everything you've put in their life. That they would look at those things through the favor of God. So that they can see the blessing. Help us to see the blessings. And help us to hand it out to the world around us. We love you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.
such a great opportunity as a family. I, I pray that you're able to just stop for a second, look around the room and how, how beautiful that is. You carry light. Everywhere you go, you carry this light. And I need your light. We need your light. Together, when we come together, we make this really bright thing. God's got a really great plan for us. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being involved in my life. Thank you for letting me be involved in yours. And I pray the greatest blessing over you and your household this Merry Christmas. I pray that you go home tonight and that you guys celebrate like you never have. But I pray more than anything else that you recognize that God has called us together as one body, as one family, and that he has a great plan for us. And so, Father, we love you, and we bless you in this place. We thank you that you were born and that you died for us. We thank you that you're a great Savior that knows us and that you've called each and every one of us to be a part of this. You love us, and we love you. We bless you in this house. In Jesus' holy, holy name we pray. Amen. So church.